Good morning. Welcome back to Foundations in Faith, continuing to walk through those foundational beliefs of, yes, Christianity, but specifically Lutheranism, the Lutheran denomination, and what we believe over and against the different Christian denominations that are out there, the different religions that are out there. We are continuing to walk through justification and talking about what that means, what it is, how it happens, um, all of those good topics as we walk through the apology of the Augsburg Confession specifically. And a little bit of review as we dive into this week's material. Last week we talked about law and gospel. And you might say, well, okay, how does that apply to justification? We're getting there today. We're making that link for you today. Because as last week we talked about the law, we talked about the different uses of the law. Uh, basically a good way to summarize that is to say the law shows us our sin. The law shows us our need for a savior. The law shows us our need for justification is a good way to put that. It tells us about the works that we should be doing as created beings and in a perfect relationship with the Father and with his creation. This is how we would act as good people, as justified people, as righteous people. Of course, that relationship, as we've covered already in a couple videos back, and that relationship between us and the Father, between us and creation itself, it was broken at the fall. And we even continue to sin moving forward into this day. We all have our own personal sins. The law shows us those sins. And so what we firmly establish is we look at the law as we hold up the law against our lives and we look into the law of God, the perfect will of God, and we say, have I met this? Not even have I met this. Am I capable of meeting this will, this law, from this point moving forward? The honest answer, the brutal truth is no. We could never keep the perfect will of God. We could never keep his law. And so what his law shows us, as it's laid out before us, is that we are sinful, that we need forgiveness, and that we are incapable of receiving or earning that forgiveness on our own. So the question then is, where does this forgiveness come from? How are we forgiven for our sins? How are we justified before God? Or another way to say, how are we declared righteous before God? And really there's two kinds of uh, camps of thought, I guess you could say, about how this works. And one would be called works righteousness, one would be called faith righteousness. And you might have already uh, um, pre-imagined that we're going to be falling firmly in the faith righteousness camp. Uh, but let's walk through a works righteousness really quickly and just kind of see what this looks like, how it plays out, why people would think that this makes sense. Um, and so works righteousness, as it says in the name, is that we are justified because of the works that we do or that our works are important in our justification that we somehow earn part of our justification and God does another part, uh, things of that nature. This isn't only in Christianity that this belief happens. Actually, I think it's every other world religion. I'm not sure of another religious system that says everything has been done for you, that you're completely passive in justification. So when you think of different religions, think of like Islam. There are the five pillars. You have to keep the five pillars in order to go to heaven. When you think of uh, Buddhism or Hinduism, those, the gods don't actually do anything for you in those religions. You have to do it all yourself as you seek enlightenment, as you seek higher knowledge, whatever that might be. And Christianity is the only religion I'm aware of that actually says God has done everything for you. You passively receive what God has done. So it makes sense that early Christian believers, that believers even up to the time of Luther, even up to the time of now, have this idea that we have to work or earn our own forgiveness in some way, shape, or form. So this is common thinking, not just in the time of Luther, but well before Luther and well after Luther as well. And the thought is that we can do enough good works to get our way into heaven. You've probably heard this from some friends, maybe they're Christian, maybe they're not, but if you ever get into a conversation about what the afterlife looks like, what life after death looks like, they might say, well, I just do as much good as I can, and I hope that's enough. That's this kind of thinking. That's a works righteousness kind of thinking. It's saying, if I do enough good, if the good outweighs the bad, it's enough, and I'll make my way into heaven. There's a really popular TV show, actually, called The Good Place. Maybe you've seen it or heard of it, but it's based off of a works righteousness type of idea. And it basically summarizes everything that you do in your life, and it assigns point totals to every action you take. And so drinking a coffee is negative five points because it's bad for your body, but buying someone else's a coffee is three points because it's bad for them, but you're still doing something nice for them. And when you die, eventually, all of these points are totaled up. 
And if you have enough good points, you go to the good place. And if you have too many bad points, you go to the bad place. That's this kind of thinking. That's what works righteousness is. And Lutheran theology has a very strong opinion against this kind of thinking. Melanchthon just lays it out for us in the Apology and says point blank, it is false that we merit the forgiveness of sins through our works. Another way of saying there is absolutely no way we could ever merit the forgiveness of sins. We can never earn the forgiveness of our sins through our work. And because to do that, to say that we could earn the forgiveness of our sins is to downplay just how devastating sin is in our lives. It's not just that I lied to someone. That's bad. That hurts that person that says I don't value that person enough to give them the truth. But it's actually the broken relationship with God. My relationship with my creator has been broken so badly that I don't see you as another creature. I don't see you as another person that's loved by God so I can lie to you and that doesn't matter. That's what we're saying when we sin. That the gravity of sin is so immense that little actions that we take could never fix that problem within our lives. Something has to happen to us. Someone has to do something for us to fix that problem, to justify us. Uh, if that weren't enough, he, Melanchthon goes on to say, it is also false and an affront to Christ to say that people who observe the commandments of God without grace do not sin. This is saying, even if you observe the commandments, even if you look at the Ten Commandments, if but you don't have faith. You can say, I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't killed anyone. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in God, but I haven't killed anyone. Melanchthon says that's not good enough. You still don't have forgiveness of sins. You are still not justified in the face of God. This is actually what the Pelagians believed uh, a long time ago. There's a, a heresy called Pelagianism. This was essentially the thought that if you keep the commandments, if you keep the will of God perfectly, um, you will earn your way into heaven. You will earn forgiveness. And this is what Melanchthon is speaking against here. Is saying, no, no, no. Even if you keep the commandments, even if you do the will of God, if you do it without faith, if you do it outside of saving faith, it's not there for the forgiveness of sins. All that, that law shows you is where you're messing up. All that, that law can do is condemn and kill you and convict you of your sin. The law cannot save you. And he draws from um, Romans 8 here to build his case for this. Because we hear this a lot. We hear this a lot as pastors. You probably hear this a lot as well. Oh, what does it matter if I believe or not? If I'm a good person, if I'm doing the things God wants me to do, isn't that enough? And in answer to that, we say in Romans 8, um, this is verses 7 and 8, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So Paul sets up this dichotomy of flesh versus spirits. These two parts of us that are at war with each other, I guess you could say. The flesh is the sinful side of us, our sinful nature. The spirit is God's work in our lives. The spirit is those promises. And the spirit and the flesh are at war with each other within us. And he says, even if we keep the law, but we don't have the spirit, if we don't have faith, if we don't have God, even if we keep the law, we're still operating in a fleshly manner, which means we're still operating in a sinful manner. It's for our own glory. It's for our own goodness, not for the glory of God, not because of that renewed relationship. Uh, Melanchthon explains this a little bit. He says, if the mind set on the flesh is hostile to God, the flesh sins even when we perform outward civil works, outward good works. Because our minds are set on the flesh, because our minds are set on the here and the now, what can I gain from this? Or more importantly, what is that person? Not thinking about God, not thinking about what he's done for us. He says, if it cannot submit to the law of God, it certainly sins even when we perform works that are excellent and praiseworthy in human eyes. If we can't submit to the will of God, if we can't submit to the law of God, we are placing ourselves over that will. We are placing ourselves over that law. We are basically saying we are gods of our own lives. Uh, Romans 14, 23 says that even a little more clearly, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Whatever doesn't proceed from the will of God, whatever doesn't proceed from our dependence on God is then a dependence on something other than God. It's working for something other than God. And in that way, it is therefore sin. 
So we've established there's absolutely no way we can earn our way to God. There's no way we can justify ourselves. We can receive righteousness through our own works. The only other answer then is for someone else to earn righteousness, to earn justification for us. And this is what we believe when we speak of faith righteousness. And we are justified not by our own works, but by faith in Jesus Christ, and more specifically, his works, the things that he's done for us on our behalf, and the grace and the mercy that he's given to us. So Melanchthon jumps in, he speaks uh, right after this section on works righteousness into faith righteousness. And he says, therefore, because people cannot by their own powers live according to the law of God, because all are under sin and are guilty of eternal wrath and death, and we cannot free be set free from sin and be justified through the law. He's summarizing everything we've talked about beforehand. We are all condemned. We cannot save ourselves. Instead, what has been given us is the promise of forgiveness of sins and justification on account of Christ. And for him and for Luther and for us today, it is that simple. Justification, righteousness, forgiveness of sins comes on account of Christ because of what he has done, because of the promises God has given us through him, and because of belief in those promises. This promise, Melanchthon says, is not conditional upon our merits. It's not conditional upon us doing anything, on us being good enough. Rather, it freely offers the forgiveness of sins and justification. Just as Paul says in Romans 11:6, if it is by works, it is no longer on the basis of grace. He's saying it's not about works. It's not about can you earn forgiveness? Can you be good enough for God? Can you be good enough for Jesus? No, this is grace. This is mercy. This is undeserved, unearned, but nonetheless a gift from God that he gives to us. So our dependence isn't upon ourselves. Rather, our dependence is wholly and completely on someone greater than ourselves. It's on our creator. It's on our savior. It's on the promises that he gives us. Do we believe in ourselves? Do we believe in our works and our own power more than we believe in the God who created us? More than we believe in our creator? More than we believe in the one who loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us? He gives us this gospel. For Melanchthon, the gospel, again, is just this clear. The gospel, which is, strictly speaking, the promise of the forgiveness of sins and justification on account of Christ. That's it. That's the gospel. That's what we believe, teach, and confess. That's what you're going to hear in every single Bible study in a Lutheran church. That's what you're going to hear in every single sermon uh, within a Lutheran church. The gospel is the promise of forgiveness of sins and justification on account of Christ. Nothing you can do, nothing anyone else can do. It was all done by Jesus Christ. We receive that forgiveness and that justification by believing in the promises that he has for us. But the promise freely offers to us, Melanchthon says, who are oppressed by sin and death. It offers to us reconciliation on account of Christ. Reconciliation, a renewing, a restoring of that relationship between us and the Father. And this reconciliation is received not by works, but by faith alone. This faith does not bring to God trust in its own merits, but only trust in the promise or the mercy promised in Christ. So for Melanchthon, for us, uh, it's that simple. It really is. We can't earn it, and we don't have to earn it, because Jesus has done everything for us. What he's given us is faith. As we hear the word of God, we're going to dive into um, how faith happens, what happens in faith in the next week, I believe. Um, but as we come to faith, as God works faith in our hearts, that faith takes hold of that promise of God, it takes hold of the promise that we are loved, that we are forgiven, that Jesus has died for us. And that because he's died for us, we have a restored relationship with God. That our sins have been forgiven. That we have eternal life with him, with Jesus Christ. It's not anything we can do our own. We can't earn these promises. We can't earn these forg this forgiveness. It is a gift from God. We are justified through faith alone. That's the, the story. That's the truth of, uh, we would say, Scripture. That's the truth of Scripture, but that's the truth of what we believe as Lutherans as well. 
So really quickly looking at this faith, um, because part of the outcry, part of the pushback against this teaching at Luther's time is that they had faith. People had faith. They knew the events that happened around Jesus Christ. They believed the events that happened around Jesus Christ. For Melanchthon, uh, it's not good enough to just say, yes, these events happened. He says in this, in this section, um, the opponents imagine that faith is nothing more than a knowledge of history. For Melanchthon, that's not good enough. It's just not just a knowledge of the facts. It's not enough to believe that Christ was born, suffered, and raised again unless we also add this article, which is the real purpose of the narrative, the whole purpose of Jesus' life, the whole purpose of the gospel, the forgiveness of sins. That's what faith grabs onto. That's what faith holds onto, the forgiveness of sins, the promise of that forgiveness. That's the whole point of everything that we do. Um, so then they go on uh, talking about the forgiveness of sins only by faith in Christ. Basically, he lays out a whole bunch of scripture lessons, a whole bunch of scriptures, um, as well as early church fathers and their teachings on faith and the righteousness that comes by faith. So I'm going to read just a few of them. Um, there's quite a few more in here, but because of time, we're getting up there in time as well. Uh, I'm just going to read a few. Paul testifies in 1 Corinthians 15, The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law. The law shows us our sin, and our sin causes death. But... Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, sin terrifies consciences. This happens through the law, which shows us the wrath of God against sin. But we gain the victory through Christ. How? How does that victory come to us? How do we gain that victory? By faith. When we encourage ourselves by confidence in the mercy provided on account of Christ. Confidence in the mercy, belief in the promises on account of Jesus Christ. In Acts 10, 43, Peter says, All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. How could he say it more clearly? We receive the forgiveness of sins, he says, through his name. That is on account of him, and therefore not on account of our merits, not on account of our contrition, attrition, love, acts of worship, or works. Rather, only because of what Jesus has done for us and belief in that. Romans 4.16, Paul says, For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed. It's as though he said, if the matter depended on our merits, the promise would be uncertain and useless, since we could never determine when we had earned enough merit. You see, the beauty of the way that God has worked this out is we don't have to be uncertain. We don't have to walk back and forth one day say, Oh, am I good enough? Have I earned enough to get into heaven the next day say oh i know i haven't earned enough it's not like a yo-yo where okay i'm in i'm out i'm in i'm out i'm in heaven i'm not in heaven i'm in heaven i'm not in heaven there's no confusion there's no doubt because it's a sure thing because it's a promise and that promise is made by someone greater than us faith takes hold of that promise says i know i know i'm going to heaven because of jesus christ and because of what he's done for us uh, I've got two more here for you, and then we'll, uh, we'll close here. In chapter 3, verse 28 of Romans, Paul sets forth this proposition, which contains the essential point of the entire discussion. This is going to sound very familiar. We hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law, specifically that faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Finally, Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. There's a whole bunch of uh, other scripture verses I've highlighted, I've walked through within here. If you want those, please do reach out to me. I'd be happy to send them on for you. I'd be happy to be in discussion about this with you. You can always contact me through email, uh, Pastor Andrew at stpaulboca.com, stpaulboca.com. You can also leave a comment on this YouTube video. I'll be checking back in there as well. Um, any way you want to get a hold of me, I'd love to be in conversation. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, I'd love to have prayer requests. I'd love to be able to pray for you throughout the week as well. So interaction would be fantastic in that way. That's all we've got for this morning. Next week, we're going to dive further into justification and faith. I hope you have a wonderful week. God bless.